Fisherman's Bread and Puppet Theater have been attracting the public's attention as their giant puppet creatures and 12-foot high stilters have paraded down our city streets and avenues in celebration and in protest. Thank you. Thank you. This is this Immerse, is immerse. The, podcast the podcast and book. And book. We are, we are delighted to have you join, to have us. join us. Immerse is immerse produced, is produced by, Charlie by Charlie Morrow, Sean McCann, Sean McCann and Bart Plantinga for Morrow Sound, 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 Vermont, Vermont and Helsinki, and, Helsinki, and, and Recital and Edition, 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 Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Immerse. 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 Immerse
How did this start? How did you get from what was your first kind of flash into this kind of thinking, and how did it lead to where you are now? So one is a current yeah. practice or favorite pieces, and the other one is sort of from the beginning to here. So, because in the book I have people's timelines and I weave them together, because mm -hmm. most people in the book have known each other and crossed paths at some point or another. Mm. Okay. So I wonder. I try my best. That's good. Right. Just, just chat. Right? And the idea is this is an informal. When I story. don't remember something, you will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> so you want me to gossip away? Yeah, gossip away. Okay, well, my theater didn't start in the States. It started in a little village outside of Munich, which we, where we had found an old abandoned former priest's dwelling, a medieval house with four foot thick walls, uh, very hard to heat, but it was cheap. And we moved into there and we had a few friends who were collaborators. Mozart. And they, and we started a dance and music company to not much success or avail, but we in, were insistent. We kept doing it. We went to Munich to perform and we participated in a German American ballet contest. How we cheated ourselves in there, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, we balleted along and they gave us a second prize <laughs> for doing totally foolish things. I made giant faces and we had a bag that we had a burlap bag with a few holes in it and we put about five of us inside the bag and in front of these big faces this burlap bag started moving and sometimes hands and arms appeared out of the holes and the, some, the, it contracted and expanded that was dance number one, and second dance was two people tightly tied together with ropes. They didn't seem to be able to get anywhere, and they succeeded, and they moved within the ropes, and they made a the whole rope dance like that, and shit like this. And we did very quickly invented arbitrary object and painting dances, like carrying a stone through the audience or something like this. And then we saw uh, Merce Cunningham and John Cage and met them after their performance and we were very impressed that in uh, on a European level there were all of a sudden some people who utilized this uh, period of expressionistic dancing that Germany had experienced and utilized it quite differently and didn't make portraitures of characters and stories and stuff, but composed and freely. And we were very impressed and we told them that. And then when we came to the States, I went in 61, I went to their studio and they had a dance class with Robert Dunn, teaching choreography to, and everybody was there. Hayes and whatever they were, Ivan Reiner, Simon and Bob, Mo uh, Bob Morris is dead now. And everybody who later on became something in dance, in modern dance in America, was in that Robert Dunn class. And I gave one class on uh, ordinariness or something like this, ordinary movements or something like this, just walking, kneeling, getting up, no bullshit, just doing things. And... I tried to find dancers out of that group, like I remember, especially Simone, Bob, and Yvonne, but I didn't have a telephone, so we never succeeded to make contact in order to meet. So instead, I talked the super of my building, Richard Tyler, Dickie Tyler. He had gotten me the apartment where we lived, which was Klaus Oldenburg's apartment, who had just moved a little bit uptown, <laughs> but he still had his Ray Gun Theater on 2nd Avenue and 2nd Street. And so we lived in Klaus's apartment, very cheap. Fifth floor, no elevator, with five kids up and no, at that time only three kids, uh, Max and Olive and uh, Maria were not born yet. And 
we we had a very hard time finding dancers to do a dance I wanted to do because the War Resisters League, together with the Living Theater, and Judith spoke German, and I didn't speak hardly any English, and uh, Julian didn't, but Judith spoke perfect German and was wonderful to talk to and support it and let me do performances in the Living Theater for nothing, just... I did performing there. And so the relationship was living here of all sisters league in the winter of 62 called for a general strike for peace. A total ridiculous enterprise because naturally there was no generality about it at all. There was maybe 200 hippies who knew about this event and that was it. But they created events for this in the living theater, in another village theater, and at Judson. Those were the three locations. And I dug out an old dance from Munich that I had done there, a dance of death, which originally was done against the pestilence in Europe on cemeteries. And I transformed it into something that didn't need the cemetery. And the dancers were Dickie Tyler's doped friends who could only work when they were doped. And I think their specialty was cocaine, but they also used other things. And they were wonderful to work with, actually, and difficult, both. And Dickie himself performed, and his wife, Dorothy Bear. And so we did a dance of death, and I used some of the old masks my friends sent me from Germany, and I made new ones in our apartment, and we performed it at Jordan and at that, I forget the name of the theater, and at the Living Theater. And yeah, and those were, they got a house together there. They did a good job. For Sisters League had a little pull at that time. It was in order to persuade Americans to the horror of nuclear arms racing. And there was big in England already, that movement didn't exist in America. And this was the first such event in America, drawing attention to this major object of nuclear arms racing, and consequently and, and almost necessarily leading to nuclear warfare. And so they were very accepting. I did the dances. Then we moved, we got, she got an invitation as a Russian teacher in Putney School in Vermont. So in 62, we moved after that event to Putney in the springtime of 62. And we did the dance there. Dickie Tyler and company came up. We performed there to the horror of the community. You you were looking for a position as a dance teacher. Oh, yeah, and I asked them to be dance teacher, because only she had a job. And I said, I teach dance. And when they saw this dance, they said, oh, no, thank you. (laughs) So So I said, oh, what about puppetry? Just out of my head. And they said, oh, that sounds so innocent, so nice, so appropriate for children. <laughs> so I got the job as puppetry teacher, and then I started a puppet theater in our house. They gave us a nice little house to live in, and we performed there every Sunday. But my relationship from then on with the other community, with the Robert Dunn, Yvonne, Simone, all the, the fancy modernness to me it, it didn't work because in, in new york we lived in the slum we lived on east 4th street avenue d we were broken into every one of our neighbors were broken and the whole thing was a mess the living conditions and dirty and a mess and a dangerous mess for us and for the kids and we thought no we we can't do these beautiful things and beautiful Galleries, we must be in the street. So we started doing street theater. I painted stories on paper scrolls that you could easily find in front of the, 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 the what was it called? The Guardian, the, the, the newspaper, yeah. the left wing newspaper on Bro- lower Broadway. And they threw out their paper scrolls. I picked up the paper scrolls. They were this tall and they made things and they called it a cranky and through a little cardboard or box and we told stories in the street and a Puerto Rican friend Bert Aponte 
He was a very noble-looking, well-dressed community organizer in the newly arrived Puerto Rican community. And he translated every word into Spanish when we performed and had a Puerto Rican and an American flag. And we did this lightweight, so whenever a cop came with light stick, we could just pack up and leave. We didn't have to do confrontations. So that was our basic technique. Don't play for the cops. And it worked. They, we didn't get arrested. We just keep walking away. But at the same time, in 63, for the rumors, Bob Nichols, Grace Paley told us about these helicopter pilots that pretended to be teachers in Vietnam, but in actuality were flying strafing missions in North Vietnam. And so the whole protest against uh, Vietnam war started right then. And we did big parades with them right away. And, and we built the puppets bigger and bigger because we realized the bigger they are, the more people can see them. So it was a very simple But solution. you started with just you and a drummer walking yeah. around. Yeah, we did that. Or also vigiling, you know, we did these quiet things where we just did nothing but a drum beat or a chime bell. And just with white or brown puppets just going along Central Park. And the cops didn't arrest us. I don't know why. They were sort of stunned or something. You know, they could have just put up all in the paddy wagon and taken us away. They didn't. They said, maybe the, the pedestrians were sympathetic and they didn't dare to, you know, something like that. But anyway, that's how it all started. Long enough tail, right? <laughs> <laughs> now your machine is broken. Yeah, it's all gone. <laughs> That's a fantastic story I mean, of your own there. Uh -huh. Awareness. I think it was, a, what do you call it, Entwicklung? <laughs> well, it's a story in, in fragments I've talked to many people again and again, but it's always, uh, it's not a cliche, it's just how it is, you know. It's just, it was naturally different aspects. Some are important, others not. Like the kids were very important. I didn't even mention the kids, and I remember how important that was. This going through Tompkins Square Park, living near it, or going to the East River, and the people we met when we went to the East River, walking, and the danger of walking there in the evening, and all those things were all elements in that life. And the continuous hassle of, yeah, the street robberies and things. I remember going to a rehearsal. Originally it was Red Grooms. He had a Delancey Street Museum, he called it, and he was somebody also on the move to go a little higher up in Manhattan. So we got his loft, and we called it right away Bread and Puppet Museum. And, yeah, the, the robberies were extreme. The, the puppeteers who came, friends who worked with us on the puppet shows, there would be days where everybody had been held up, either at gun or knife point and their money taken off them on the way from East 6th Street or East 4th Street or East 3rd Street. Has happened, yeah. There were those days. I remember that. Oh, mostly breaking in when you're not in the house and somebody would come in. Well, you had money street. taken off at gunpoint from you, and so did Stefan Brecht coming to visit us, and so did Manny Narcisa. It was the common thing. That and was a different neighborhood then. Absolutely. Do, do you recall at that time uh, meeting Karen Bacon? Because I had met you through Karen Bacon, amongst, uh, aside from the art world. Karen Bacon, Oscar. Do you remember that? She was, familiar. she was the event maker for the city of New York, and she uh, engaged you to perform in Central Park. And oh, yeah, we started working with the city and the city. doing big yeah. workshops. Yeah, she was the no. city. Okay, Karen. Yes. Karen Bacon sounds very familiar. Yeah, yeah. was she in the Council on Arts and Playgrounds yeah, she, or yeah, something she, like this? Well, she was uh, doing events for the. Parks Department. Yeah, we probably worked with her. You then. worked with her, because I think she was the one who was telling me about your work. And her. 65, we did yes, big exactly. events with, with in me. all the boroughs of New York, actually, in all the big slums everywhere. Bedford, Stuyvesant, Bronx, Harlem, East Harlem, yeah, everywhere. Big events, lots of kids involved, and they did organizing for us. There's a nice movie um, a friend of ours, Jules Rabin, made in the 60s of these street shows and and park shows. Right, oh, made a good movie of it. Yes. Is, is it available anywhere? 
but I'm sure you can get it over the internet. Who, know, who would know that? How does he spell Raven? R-A-B-I-N. R-A-B-I-N. Oh, Raven. Okay. Yeah, so it's Raven, the baker, bakery yep. in Plainfield. Yep. But I'll find out how yeah. they can... Yeah, I'd really like to know that. Yeah. Um, They're silent. There's no sound. Oh, I'd very much love to see them. So he was in the workshop, is it? Uh, some of the shots he shot and others he gave the kids the camera to shoot it. So it was an interesting outcome. And it started in New Jersey. They found out there were brick factories, so we knew there would be clay there. So we drove out there and dug clay out of the, the muddy ground where the clay gets harvested. And we filled it in, in buckets and into a van. And was that in Bolton? Bolton. Bolton? In the, I mean, it was the west, the north, north New Jersey, but on the west, slightly the out route. Probably, west. yeah. Who do Andy Trumpeter took us there. Right. He, he knew. That's what a great person. Yeah, Andy. Oh, you remember Andy? Yeah. You do. Oh my God. He gosh. did that job. He was in the workshop, and he knew such things. So he knew when we said, "Where do we get clay?" Uh, 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 he said, "Oh, let's go to New Jersey. There, there. That's where the bricks are made, and that's where they have clay." Well, I'm from New Jersey, so I'm, I'm <laughs> familiar with bricks. <laughs> the connection with baking. I, I know you're a cook, but how did you begin to combine the <laughs> performing and the baking? How did that? How did that ever happen? Well, the, the first thing was our when we came to the states, the the bread was unbearable. We didn't understand how people could eat the bread. I think the the, the Wonder Bread event had just hit America. <laughs> Serve Wonder Bread. <laughs> Wonder helps build strong bodies 12 ways. Really hard, and probably in the late 50s or something. So bread wasn't bread anymore. It was this mushy, white, fluffy, like cotton stuff that you could, the whole thing, you could put it together. And the kids did that. They took a loaf, put it together with a little ball of food for shooting at each other. <laughs> so, and they called that bread and we said, what the heck? And I had grown up in Silesia and the Silesians along the older river, the, the, the soil wasn't good for wheat or good and, you know, highly demanding grains. So the only thing they could grow was rye and they had rye bread. And rye goes anywhere. Rye goes in Mongolia. Rye goes up in the Alps. Rye goes in any soil. And the highway department here uses it to fix the sides of, you know, when they gravel a side of a highway, then they need a tough grass that will hold the soil, and that's why. So I came, I went from New York to New York to buy my rye from the highway department. That was the cheapest rye to get. And then I bought a little Colombian or Polish. Colombian. We had both kinds, grain, grain grinder. And that's how we got our rye, and we made sourdough, and, and made the bread. And we clamped it on the table, and the marks yeah, are still Yeah, the marks are still here. <laughs> that was the table we had there. Her father made the table. <laughs> and that's how we made the, the rye bread. And in the shows, we thought that people, we had the habit of giving them the bread before the show, and no garlic, just bread. And we went around and gave them bread pieces to eat, and we found they were a better audience when they were chewing. We liked them better when they were sitting there. They had something to do. They didn't have to be bored, stiff, because our shows were very slow. <laughs> they, everybody remembers me in rehearsal always saying, slower, slower, it's okay, but slower. <laughs> yeah, so that's how the bread came in, and then we got the habit. And then Alka said, why don't we call it bread and puppet? And that's it. That's stuck. We did it. And then we did the baking, and then luckily we didn't have to live in New York forever and could build our own bread ovens. You know, there was this very nice tradition here in Quebec of bread ovens from clay, from local clay, very simple structures, and I built those, and they are just amazing ovens. They take, in an oven like the one I have here, it takes me two buckets of pine wood, of soft wood, to bake 25 loaves of bread in that thing. So it's totally amazing. 
the result. And know. how, in what Put time, in. once you start, you start the oven? Well, well, start the oven, you let the fire go for an hour, just wipe the embers out, then you make a loaf, bring the loaves out, put a little kindling or cardboard in for a flame, shortly before you clean out the oven, clean it out, cast the loaves in, close it an hour later, it's big. Yeah, it works pretty good. It's a way of living. It's in, in, incomparably better than any other method, method of cooking these ovens. They contain the heat totally. Yep. Okay, that was the oven speech. Yes. I would like to uh, talk about the, the theater that you do that takes large spaces. I think one of the most impressive experiences I've had has been when you used the full nature space where you have things that you don't even see in the woods you have things that occur from place to place i was wondering that about about your how all of that came into your brain to do and your feelings about it well the, we were lucky because when her father bought this farm from daisy Dot, the highway was the highway department was building 91 and they were looking for gravel all over and Daisy Dobbs' field there that was a pasture was all gravel. So her father sold that field to the highway department. Not the field, the gravel. The gravel. And they took the gravel out. And when they had taken the gravel out, they were ready to even it out. But that happened to be the day when we came visiting to take a look at the farm because we had sort of in mind, maybe we can move here sometime. And I saw this beautiful amphitheater that, that they had created. And I stopped the machines from <laughs> evening it out. They wanted to make it all. That was part of their contract to pull the dirt from the side in and flatten it all out again. And I stopped them. And uh, her really father fine. agreed that we didn't finish. The, they were ha happy that they had to do so much less work. <laughs> and they left happily, probably drinking a little afterwards. And... Voila, we had an amphitheater. So that was number one. And then this beautiful pine forest right above it, you know. So we went in there and a couple of our friends had died. Maurice was on his deathbed. And we built memorials for them inside the pine forest. And then we acquired the habit of doing memorials in there. But also to lead audience in there and start a pageant in there on a small scale and then have them come out of the dark pine forest into the bright sunlight and see the whole 30 acres employed. The, the real spectacle isn't the puppetry, it's the sky, but, but you animate the underneath sufficiently so that people realize that. All of a sudden, the, what the light does to the things becomes the most important thing, and people get that. They sit there and all of a sudden the cloud bursts open or goes away and the clear sky comes underneath. These are the real events. And, uh, and then the... And we had such luck with the, with the circuses over, you know, from 71 to 98, the big circuses, one, one Sunday a summer, and we'd have these incredible... No, we'd do it Saturdays and Sundays. Saturdays and Sundays. Sundays. But... It would be, you know, days it would start rainy or, or cloudy, or and then at the last minute, the, a ray of sun would burst through, and you know, just many times again. Yeah, just, we had rained out pageants plenty, not but plenty. it didn't matter. Not plenty. Yeah, it didn't matter. We played usually anyway, or made short interruptions for a downpour. You now the weather has always been good, even the bad weather has been good. We did a few winter pageants, right? Yes, plain in Plainfield. In Plainfield, that was we the real... did. That was a big one, that was yeah. A big one. But we did some here also, some snow events with Tamara choreographing. Yeah. And the strange thing is about John Bell, who sort of a historian of, yeah, he is, of puppetry. He found out that this area of the Northeast Kingdom had in the 20s mm. big pageantry on Crystal Lake. And when you take a look at their photo albums of these kind of things, they look like bread and puppet. Everybody clad in white, moving with sheets of bed sheets, creating forms from bed sheets, and totally amazing stuff. It's a tradition we didn't know about, but we are just going after that tradition. That's why pageant park. 
Pageant Park is probably named my, because uh, of the pageant. I've yeah. seen the photographs, the post, um, they they, postcards. Yes. Mm. Pageants. And right, right. I had a chance once to find a full album of the pageant postcards yeah. Yeah. in New Hampshire, and I didn't buy it. And before it a week later, and it was gone. Yeah, yeah. May Day. Maybe. Yes. And May Day. That's right. Pageant. May Day. So those were actually political, those pageants. They had political elements in them. Because May Day used to be Socialist Worker Day. America invented their own, whatever it's called. What's it called in America? It's not called. What's it called? Labor Day? Labor Day. Labor Day. Before that, it was the Walpurgis. Oh, yeah. Wasn't it? In Germany? Oh, old Walpurgisnacht. Oh, yes. It's something with landscape and desire. Yeah, I think it was more Barton than Glover, but it was on Crystal Lake, those events. Pretty amazing, huh? Think of that. And then I ended up there. Yeah, also. you ended up there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's amazing that we all wound up here. I mean, you think of it, Dick and Allison were here. Really? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, these various communes and, and, right, right, right. and my contingent, yeah. uh, we were yeah. all of us yeah. so, well, somehow yes. drawn to this location. And Earth People Park, those people, it's That's not right. so far. But that was a big organization. That's totally gone, right? I think Is that so. still? Yeah, yeah. They, I think it was decommissioned or something. Decommissioned, yeah. And then the other one, what's the one called over there in Burke, near Burke, where Carl Schwartz was part of, and he was a brilliant pianist and accordion player. Right. But he's always cranky with us because he never made enough money here for all the things he did here. He is getting, he feels he always got cheated, not reimbursed enough and all this kind of thing. But we don't have that system, so we never offered it. Or it's a different system, you know, people figure out how much should we make, how many can we give people, that kind of thing. It's not like, you know, how much should a good technician get or doesn't work. No, I certainly understand. When you deal with a uh, volunteerism right. and small sums of money, you have a formula for art and you also have a formula, formula for, for grumbling, grumbles. No, totally. The justice is very hard to come by. Yeah. That's right. Whom do you pay? Whom do you not pay? Who gets half? And all yeah. that. Right. Your inspiration for the Burning Man Festival, right? Yeah. yeah. I never acknowledged you for that. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Still doing the big, big thing? The big things, yeah. Big paintings. Big paintings. Big paintings, yeah. The sculpture has to be in the summer when the, when the clay is soft. But you haven't made any big sculpture for a while, huh? You've been using cardboard mainly. Well, the big hand, the big blue hand. That's cardboard. No, that's sculpted. The fingers are sculpted. On clay? On clay. Oh. Yeah. Where do you get your clay now? Local clay hill? We reuse the same clay all over again. And off and on we go, there's a on the Sheffield River along uh, 122, and it's off. When it's in Sheffield. There's a wonderful clay wall. There's a little one there in, outside of Orleans. A clay wall by, by the side yeah. of a river. By the river here. Yeah. On the way from Orleans to the trading post, Evansville, you know, trading post. Ah, uh, do you know? Clay Hill. Clay Hill. Do you know whose land the river is no, on there? It's called Clay Hill. So. There's so much clay here. Actually, any brook you go to here, when you take a look at the way the water runs, when you come to a turn of the water, in the outside of the turn there will be a clay deposit. Uh -huh. Any brook here, there's so much clay in the soil here. Yeah. But in quantities, that thing in Sheffield on, the, on that river there, that's probably 30, 40 feet steep wall, all clay. Yeah, you should see, see my archive. He will take you through it because he's been doing an amazing job. Uh -huh. uh, I'm I'm challenged. I'm a little what do you call it? <laughs> wishy washy. Yes, not wishy. -washy. <laughs> I guess I could be wishy washy, but whatever it is, I don't handle paper well. Uh -huh. I handle sound well and I handle uh -huh. technology well. But he has a gift for organizing paper, and he's made beautiful jackets and so forth. We have a collection of posters, mm -hmm. all my projects, all the media. So Charlie's had hundreds of boxes of ephemera uh -huh. that I. Go through one piece at a time, wow. put it in a computer, give it a code wow. number, put it in a... So I'd love to see to that it. sometime. Yeah, that would be great to oh, come yeah. over there and to Got give us... New York early stuff. When the weather is better. And who right. else would have that? Yeah, there's a lot of How many people there that you in know? the village and right. stuff when it was a freebie concert or something yeah, yeah, yeah. would save the posters? Well, that's right. He did. 
You know, I've done thousands of, of events, a lot of them international and global, and so, but they're all informal with people doing pretty much what they, they do. Yeah. And so they represent uh, our community everywhere. Yeah. It's and most, a little microcosm of New uh, York at yeah. that time. Yeah. yeah. Right. So you totally relate to it because yes, you were, yes, yes. You were yeah, part the, of it too. Yeah, and the oddity of the, this particular section here, the most remote part in Vermont, Thank you. Become much. such an attraction point for New Yorkers. Yes. Oh, yeah. I talked about resident Lewis N. Parker, who wrote in the program that any pageant is an act of local patriotism. It is an incident in a great act, praise, and thanksgiving. Wow. Thank you very much for yeah. sharing your thoughts and your story. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Welcome, Charlie. Well, I'm looking forward to our collaborative. Hebrews. Hebrews. That's a good word for it. Yeah, that's as good a word as anything. <laughs> Thank you. This is Immerse, the podcast and book. We are delighted to have you join us. Immerse is produced by Charlie Morrow, Sean McCann, and Bart Plantenga for Morrow Sound, Vermont and Helsinki, and Recital Edition, Los Angeles. Immerse. Immerse. An empty shell fall back into the sea.